Uh, before we get going, just I uh, would like to um, thank our sponsors, uh, including the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, White Castle, the Columbus Foundation, UBS, and the Japan Foundation of New York, and all of our other festival sponsors uh, who make this all possible uh, and also make it all entirely free. Um, <laughs> Up next uh, is uh, Emmy Gannis will be speaking. Uh, Emmy is a cartoonist from the Midwest. Her nonfiction comics often explore themes of loss, fringe thought, and foolhardy misadventures. Uh, her work has appeared in several publications, including Bitch Magazine, uh, the graphic canon of Crime and Mystery, and the Eisner-nominated anthology, Eat More Comics, The Best of the Nib. Uh, her self-published memoir, Baseline Boulevard, was nominated for Slate's Cartoonist Studio Prize in 2016. She's also the editor of Unknown Origins and Untimely Ends, an anthology of nonfiction mystery comics. Uh, Emmy received her BA in Art History and Visual Arts from the University of Chicago and an MFA in Sequential Art from the Savannah College of Art and Design. She's been teaching comics uh, to college students since 2013 and is currently uh, Associate Professor of Comics and Narrative Practice at the Columbus College of Art and Design. So come on up. Hello. They told me that there's this, this clicker thing. Let's see if I can figure it out. Anyway, hi. Uh, thanks, Ben, for introducing me. Uh, I, I am Emmy Guinness, as he mentioned. Uh, and I often get asked to talk about lettering stuff a lot uh, because I like doing lettering and I'm uh, pretty, uh, I think I'm pretty good at it. And I teach a hand lettering class at uh, the Columbus College of Art and Design, where I teach, and often when I, ooh, I've already, I've already destroyed the clicker. Here we go. Ah, yes, there we go. Awesome. I was also, I was also told to just pick this up if I'm going to move around. I'm a person that moves around. I'm an animated person. Um, uh, usually, when I have these conversations with people, uh, people will say, uh, "Oh, I, I could never do lettering. My, my handwriting is awful." Uh, and usually when I'm having these talks uh, or giving these presentations, this is the part where I say, it's totally okay if your handwriting is terrible because lettering isn't writing, it's drawing, right? Um, it's just letters are just shapes and we can all draw shapes, right? If you can draw something, you can draw like a square and a triangle and stuff. And uh, our, we, we literally use a different part of our brain to uh, think about letters. Like when we're writing and reading, uh, we're using a different part of our brain than we're using when, our, when we're drawing. And so the challenge to lettering is teaching yourself to use that drawing part of your brain when you're creating the letters. Uh, so usually this is the part of the talk where I then go into a bunch of uh, different ways that we can make letters look pretty, right? Because that's like the skill that I have that not a lot of people have. And I talk about tools and uh, techniques and assure you that no matter how terrible your handwriting is, you can make beautiful letters. And that is not what I am going to talk about today. Today, I am going to assure you that even if you have the prettiest handwriting, your lettering can be terrible. Uh, so a lot of times when people talk about bad lettering, uh, Windsor McKay gets brought up. Uh, <laughs> Windsor McKay is an incredible artist. Uh, if you've had a chance to go downstairs into the reading room, there's some of his original work down there. There's also some of his original work uh, back in the gallery. Uh, if you get the chance to go on a tour while you're here, you'll be able to see some of his work there as well. Um, and if, you're, if you don't get a chance to, or even if you do, uh, if you have the opportunity to come back to Columbus, or if you are from Columbus, then some other time when the people who work here are not like incredibly busy with CXC, I highly encourage you to reach out to the Billy Ireland and pull some of Windsor McKay's pages and go look at them in the reading room because they are incredible. Uh, but the lettering it leaves something to be lacking. Uh, and, but I do want to point out that like these letters themselves are like fine. They're not beautiful. They're not like amazing, gorgeous works of art or anything, but they're like absolutely passable. The, the letters, the handwriting 
which I don't like to use because it's like not writing, it's drawing. But the handwriting is not the problem here. And Lord knows we've, oop, we've all seen terrible digital lettering. So this is not about whether or not our letters look pretty. This is not about whether or not they're legible. This is about something else entirely. So what makes lettering bad? And I think in order to talk about what le makes lettering bad, we have to identify like what makes lettering good. Uh, and in order to talk about what makes lettering good, uh, I think we have to talk about what, what makes art good, uh, which can be a difficult conversation. I've been teaching art for many years and often people who don't teach art will say to me like, oh, that must be so hard because art is so subjective. And it like is kind of, but like also kind of not. <laughs> Sometimes it depends. Um, but uh, we do have things that we're looking for when we're grading. Like, I don't know uh, how many of you in here are students or maybe have been students of art of some kind. So like when we are grading your work and we're assessing your work, usually we have some kind of assessment rubric. Like I can assure you that we're not out here just grading you based on vibes or like, I guess I can't speak for anyone else. Uh, I can speak for myself. I'm not grading you based on vibes. I have an assessment rubric where I'm looking for very specific things. And no matter what I am looking at, almost every assessment rubric, uh, there's going to be these three things in some form on them. There will probably be other things that are more specific to the assignment. Uh, these might be like phrased differently. But these are like three of the things that I'm going to be looking at. Composition, creativity, and craftsmanship are going to come up almost every time. Um, so what does that mean in the context of lettering and like specifically comic book lettering is what I'm talking about. Um, so composition, uh, is it in the right place? Uh, does it make sense on the page? Does it contribute to an overall balanced design? Does it create an appropriate visual hierarchy? Does it aid in the flow of the reading of the page? Um, Creativity. I'm not talking about reinventing the wheel. Like I'm not expecting us to like invent new letters or anything. And uh, you know, very rarely when we look at creativity, are we expecting you to show us something that we've never seen before? But like, did you consider style? Like, did you utilize uh, the medium? Right? Uh, does the text in this? In this context, does it have expressive, uh, is it expressive? Does it have distinctive visual qualities that are specific to the context that it's in? Did you utilize text as a visual narrative tool to its fullest potential? Um, and craftsmanship. Was the text executed consistently, precisely, with meticulous attention to detail? Does it demonstrate uh, proficiency with the tools that the student used to create it. Um, and that, that right there, that's where we think about if the letters look pretty or not, right? And in the case of lettering, and this is not always true uh, for all art forms, but in the case of lettering, I would say that these three things are in order of importance. <laughs> like, maybe don't even worry about this one until you figure out the other two. And like, honestly, maybe don't even worry about these two until you figure out that first one. And really, in order for lettering to be like good, like not, not necessarily like the greatest, but just good, you probably want at least two of these things, you know? Because you can have like pretty boring text designs that are really skillfully executed, and that's good lettering. And you can have really expressive text designs that are a little bit wonky. And that's probably good lettering also. And literally none of it matters if it's not in the right place. <laughs> it needs to be in the right place. So you must consider the text as a visual object, just like any other object on the page. Because these are just marks made on paper. 
like you might look at this and you might see an owl and a turtle and they're hanging out. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just like ink marks on paper. And this, that's just ink marks on paper. You might see uh, letters that form words that have meaning. Uh, but at the end of the day, though, that's also just marks on paper. They're not different. And if you're thinking about them as different, you are doing it wrong. And that's like maybe the spiciest take that I will have today is that you <laughs> are doing it wrong. And I know that people are going to be like, oh, but like, you know, it's traditionally been a division of labor. And of course, people are going to think about it separately because like there's a different letter. If you're not, if you're thinking about it differently, you're making your own life harder at the very least, or God forbid, you're making your letters life harder. And please don't do that. <laughs> uh, so don't think of them as different things. Let's talk about composition. <laughs> uh, when we talk about composition, when we think about composition with lettering, there are really three different things that we're thinking about. We want to think about the composition on the page as a whole, the composition within individual panels, and then composition <laughs> within the balloon shape. Um, so on a page layout, your balloon placement should always follow or direct the reading flow. And most of us in here, how many of us make comics in here? So most of us in here are probably, if we're making comics, we're making comics uh, probably mostly for an English speaking audience. We might be making comics in English and for comics written in English and for comics written in most European languages, we are going to read them, uh, read the panels left to right, up to down in that like priority order. Um, and so we never want the balloons to like stray us away from the path of reading the panels in the correct order. And it, it's a, it works very well when it works. You know, these are beautiful layouts. If, you, if your eye just goes through the balloons, it leads you approximately through the page how it's supposed to go. Lovely, they work together, brilliant. Um, these are more complicated. <laughs> And I want to thank my colleague, Craig Campbell, sitting in the back of the class. Hi, Craig. Uh, he wrote a really amazing uh, genre comics class that I uh, had the privilege of teaching a sec session of last year and pulled some of the worst comics I've ever seen <laughs> as examples for that class. And so I have some of them as examples here. So like, let's, let's walk through uh, one of these train wrecks of a page. Uh, first of all, you have a writer problem. Uh, there's too much text on this page. And I know that like, if we're, if we're working with a writer, we can't always control that. But if you can control that, maybe edit your text down. Maybe you don't need that much text in a comic. In fact, you don't need any text in a comic, actually. I love two things. I love hand lettering. I love silent comics. I'm a very complicated person. <laughs> <laughs> but you really don't need that much text. Um, so the second issue, uh, there's, a, there's some confusion uh, with reading order. Uh, is we could, you know, is, is there some confusion where to go after the second balloon? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. There, is there like a chance that my eye might like go straight over from left to right to four? Like possibly. Uh, I think that if five and six weren't there, we would probably, you know, jump down to three. But there's always there's always a, a danger of putting a balloon too low if you have balloons all in a row like that because we're trained to read left to right, right? So our eye might do that. But it, honestly, it's probably fine. What, what's more than likely going to happen, though, is our eye is going to go to the third balloon, and then we're going to go right over to balloon five because it's right next to it. And also, even worse, it's breaking panel. The balloon cuts over into the first panel, and that's an indication to us that that balloon is part of that moment, right? It's literally inserted into that moment. And so that's indicating that it's part of that moment. So our eye is going to go directly from three to five. We're going to skip four entirely. And then this problem continues down the page. We go from six, we go right to 10. Again, 10's breaking panel. We're going to skip an entire panel of this comic now. Um, and same issue with 12, 15, 15's breaking panel. We've skipped two whole panels of this comic. Um, and the entire comic is like this. Uh, 
It's a mess. Sorry, my lettering sucks. Ah, your lettering is beautiful. Okay. It's just very thin. Okay. I can't read it. Okay, is this better? Do I do I need to project? No one's ever told me to project before. This is very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> this has never been a problem that I've ever had. This is great. I'm I'm learning. I'm I'm getting I'm getting better. I was always the kid in the class that was told to be quiet. Um, all right, so uh, don't do that. So composition within individual panels. Uh, we we need to uh, make our compositions feel visually balanced, they should direct the eye to a clear focal point. Um, and uh, any great artist, like there's so many different, to, it, look, it seems like a lot of y'all in here are artists, so you know the deal. There's like many different like composition tips and tricks and guides and grids like this. And any great artist, you, you pull some of their work down, just pull a random panel, slap a grid like this over it, and it's gonna like, line up in so many different ways. And it's not necessarily that those artists are like putting a complex grid down over every panel and then drawing on it. A lot of these become intuitive over time. Um, but you know, everything is oriented in this way to create that visual balance and to create a clear focal point. Um, and all of the objects in the image, including the lettering, including the balloons, need to be considered uh, they're all just shapes that need to be arranged into this balance. Um, so when you are designing your panels, you need to consider text placement from the earliest stages of the process. In the thumbnails, in your sketches, you need to know where the text goes. Uh, many composition issues are just, a, they are a result of poor planning. These compositions do not appear to have been designed to accommodate text at all. And like, granted, they were not great compositions in the first place necessarily, uh, but they're really not helped by squeezing text into them at the last minute. Um, but leaving space for text is not enough. Uh, it also has to be in the right place. You have to strategically place that space, and then it has to be well utilized. So like, oh, I, I have this. Oh, that's so exciting. Uh, so like here, there's plenty of space uh, for this balloon up here, but like if this is the speaker, like I kind of understand how like that ended up there. Cause like if, if that's the speaker and our balloons up here, like our tail is gonna cut through this or it's gonna go around. So like I kind of get that. I'm not really sure where the best place to put this balloon is. It's not there. I can tell you it's not there. Uh, but like, again, you know, if I put it here, the tail's gonna, I'm not really sure. Uh, this, there's no excuse for this. We could have just made this balloon a different shape. Like there's plenty of room there. Just use the space that you have. Um, anyway, you need to know exactly where your text is gonna go and you need to know exactly how much space it's going to occupy in order to achieve that compositional balance. Um, these compositions feel relatively balanced uh, without the text. They were certainly designed uh, with text in mind. Like there's clearly space left for it, but it's just, it's not nearly enough space. Um, and what ends up happening is that the text ends up covering up important parts of the art, uh, by which I mean main characters, speaking characters, uh, and the focal point. This car is the focal point of this panel, and it's like almost entirely covered. I think what happened here, I think, is that the artist either did not know about or forgot about this balloon in the third panel, um, cause there's plenty of space for like a pan, a balloon here and a balloon here. We just didn't quite leave enough space here and there. Like if these were a little smaller, like the drawings could have been a little smaller. We wouldn't have that overlap. And then it's like, oh shit, there's another balloon in panel three. I guess I'll just put it here. I, I, it, anyway, don't do that. So utilize the space that you have strategically. The placement of your text should never be an afterthought. Um, you want to avoid creating those unnecessary overlaps. You want to avoid creating odd areas of negative space. You want to avoid creating awkward tangents for my non-art people in the room. My art people know what I'm talking about. But a, a tangent is where you have these lines that are like just barely touching, or like almost touching, 
and it creates like compositional tension or it can create uh, confusion. Uh, it can make silhouettes less clear. It can create confusion in terms of like depth. We want to avoid that. Um, there is more than enough room in this panel for this to have not happened. Uh, there's no reason for the, this. This tail could be over here. It would be closer to the horse's mouth. It doesn't need to touch that. Uh, we could move this whole balloon down and move this balloon over. With the, I don't know. I don't know how or why this happened. Um, and prior to the placement of the text, this panel has a lot going on for it compositionally. Like you know, you could be like, Emmy, this isn't fair. Like you pulled a bunch of, you know, old Charlton comics. They were made really, really quickly and cheaply. Uh, you know, of, of course the lettering is going to be bad. But like the artists that are working on these are not unskilled. Um, you know, there's there's a lot that is compositionally strong here. Like it roughly follows the rule of thirds, right? Um, we've got uh, stuff that's like lining up on these grid lines. It's obviously designed for text. Like if, it, if there wasn't going to be text in there, I would probably orient it like that. But anyway, it uses utilizes contrast to draw our eye. Uh, it has a very distinct overlapping foreground, middle ground, and background that creates a sense of depth. We have clear readable silhouettes. That's definitely a cowboy on a horse. That's foliage in the foreground. That's two people in the background like, oh my god, a cowboy on a horse. You know, it's very clear what's happening. Um, we have leading lines, right? We have these like billowing dust clouds that are like pointing to this guy. We have two people. They're like line of sight is like looking at him. So we're going to look at him. We have a framing element, right? The foliage creates this like literal reverse proscenium framing this guy. It's it's like well composed. And then we just slam the text in there and it's tangent city. Uh, like how how does this happen? And how it happens is clearly the artist is not thinking about the text in the same way that they're thinking about the art. Um, and like a lot, like I said, like it's not like artists are necessarily putting down a whole big grid on every panel and, and going through it. They're more than likely this becomes intuitive over time, but for whatever reason, it has not become intuitive with text placement. They're thinking about it as a different thing. And, you know, it's also entirely possible that this was done by a totally separate letterer, in which case you have even less of an excuse. That's your whole job. <laughs> you should be better at this. Um, so composition within the balloon, uh, the text and the balloon or the caption box or the negative space where you're putting the text, they also have a compositional relationship. And you need to consider how you arrange your text within a shape. Uh, and to do this, you're actually thinking about three different shapes. Uh, you are thinking about the shape itself, so the shape of your balloon, in this case. Uh, you are thinking about the shape the text creates, which I sometimes call word shape. Um, right? This is like all the same sentence, and it, I can create all kinds of different word shapes with it. Uh, and then uh, the shape of the negative space that is inside the balloon uh, along with that word shape. Uh, and you always want to arrange your text in a way that makes sense with the shape or vice versa. Like if I am going to orient my text in like a, a vertical kind of shape, I probably don't want to put it in a balloon that's like more horizontally oriented, right? They should complement each other. You should center your text inside of the shape. I don't know why this needs to be said, <laughs> but it does. I see this all the time. <laughs> center your text inside the shape. Um, and make sure that your text has some breathing room inside the shape. And this is probably the, the biggest crime that uh, we see in those, uh, those Windsor McKay pages, is that Windsor McKay leaves almost no space inside the balloons uh, for the text. It has barely any breathing room. It creates a lot of like compositional tension. Um, it doesn't help with readability. It's very dense. 
Uh, go check, go again, go check out the originals here at the Billy Ireland. <laughs> They're incredible. Um, and that breathing room, that negative space inside the text, we want it to be relatively even. You want a relatively even amount of space all the way around between the text and the bounds of your shape, so the balloon border in this case. Um, so you can arrange text into many different shapes. Not all balloon shapes are going to be appropriate to every word shape, you know? Like I can, this is clearly not appropriate. I can make the balloon maybe more vertical or maybe I make the text more horizontal and adjust accordingly. Um, which brings me to uh, not using ellipse templates. This is a thing that I see a lot also, is uh, people will use ellipse templates. Uh, a combination of words can make a bunch of different word shapes, but they can only make so many. There's like a finite amount of word shapes that you can make in any given sentence. Um, and an ellipse template will lock you into a particular shape. And sentences can't always necessarily conform to that shape. So that's going to create a higher likelihood of creating those awkward tangents, creating uneven negative space. And we don't want that, right? We have these areas where like text is like almost touching or like lit actually touching uh, the balloon border. We don't want that. Uh, we have space where like we have so much negative space on one, the side and like none on the top and bottom or vice versa. This is, it's not, it's not good. We don't, this is, don't do it. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to digress for just a moment here. Uh, when speaking of not relying on templates to talk about creativity for just a second. And I know I said, maybe don't even think about that until you figure out composition, but they're related. <laughs> um, when we think about speech balloons, most people think of like some type of ellipse, right? Like if I were to say to this room, like everybody draw a word balloon, like this is the shape you probably would have drawn, right? I don't understand. Okay. Why? Why is that? Who, who made this rule? This is not a rule. This is not written down anywhere. There are so many shapes. I don't know how this happened to us. But you don't have to make your balloons ellipses. I, a bunch of people raised your hands in here when I asked if you made comics. If you are a cartoonist, no one is making you do this. Uh, if you were in my lettering class this semester, I am literally making you do this right now for assignment three. Um, but with that very small exception, no one is making you do this. You are the master of your own balloon shapes. You get to decide what shape your balloons are. Uh, and there are so many shapes. I have nothing against ellipse shapes. I have nothing against rounded shapes. Rounded shapes are great. Uh, but the fact that they're hard to draw is not an excuse for your word balloons looking bad. And I do hear this excuse sometimes, like, oh, like, my lettering's bad. It's just, you know, ellipses are really hard to draw. OK, draw a different shape. Just draw a different shape, like literally any shape. There are so many shapes to pick from. And another perk of that is that having interesting, weird balloon shapes means that you can arrange your text into interesting, weird word shapes. Uh, so that's fun. All right. So now I'm going <laughs> to go into a little cautionary tale. I'm going to break down an example. Um, and uh, apologies to Frank Miller, although I will say Frank Miller's doing fine. Like he's, I don't feel that bad. He's, he's doing good. Um, so this is uh, some panels from the graphic novel 300. Um, and I find the text bewildering. <laughs> and, and I would like to point out the letters themselves, the letter forms are gorgeous. They're incredibly consistent. They are stylized, yet not overcomplicated. Uh, they're very legible. Great letters, very pretty letters. What's all this negative space doing up there? What's going on? Also, we have the balloons are like overlapping our character. Don't need to overlap our character. We have plenty of negative space we can move it up into, and overlapping the character in a very strange way. Like, we have one speaker. There's no reason to have two tails like this. And like, I don't know, kind of looks like a little alien antenna or like 
like our, our eyebrows are speaking or something. Like I don't, I don't understand why it's like that. Um, and then it's also arranged in the balloon in a very strange way. Like when I first saw this, I thought that perhaps this was digitally lettered because it's all left aligned, right? It's not centered. Um, and so, this is also something that I see sometimes is people will digitally letter and they'll just, you know, they'll open a bounding box and they'll just type into it and just, just wherever the bounding box ends, like that's where the line of text ends and the word, you know, that's, where we break line and I, I don't, you guys, you have a cursor and you can click anywhere in the line of text and you can hit return and, cr and create a new line of text. Uh, you, you're in control. But anyway, so I thought maybe this is digitally lettered, but it's not, it's hand lettered. So we just started lettering on the side and then I guess just, just ended on the other side wherever. I, it's very strange. So we have what's called a rag uh, which is where you have this like ragged edge on one side of your text. Um, and then like possibly more bewildering and related is you have all of these words that are broken up. And like, I get it. Sometimes you have a long word and you don't have very much space on the page. And like, sometimes it happens, but you really, really want to avoid it. And like, you really, really could have avoided this. We know that we have plenty of space on the page. Um, and like, also the balloons don't have to be this shape. If you need a wider balloon, make the balloon wider. Like you did, these aren't standard issue balloon shapes that you got from like the balloon shape factory. You can draw any shape. Um, so it's, it's very confusing to me. So we have several issues. We have the awkward negative space. We've got rags because the text isn't centered. There's really not enough space in these speech balloons. Honestly, like I would give them a little bit more breathing room. Uh, they're, they're really text heavy. We have, a lot of sentences, like multiple sentences in every balloon. And I think that one of the great things about word balloons uh, is that they can mimic speech, right? They can create cadence, they can create rhythm and enunciation. And when you just slam a bunch of sentences into one balloon, you eliminate all of that and you're not utilizing the balloon to its fullest storytelling potential. Um, and then of course the balloon overlaps the character. Um, so I, I did my best to try to fix some of these issues. First, just move them up. Just move, move the balloons up. Uh, easy, quick fix for the negative space issue. And then I tried to like reshape this, like you know, get rid of some of the uh, some of the overlap by you know we don't actually need two tails, so we could do this compound balloon thing. But I wasn't really happy with this balloon shape. It's like not very. Um, I, I don't really like the shape, so. I try, maybe we'll like try breaking up the text a little bit. Um, and so we have, we have the overlap again, but we also have like the text is more broken up. It says, long I pondered my king's cryptic talk of victory and time proved him wise. From free Greek to free Greek, spread the word, right? There's a pause there. There's a natural pause between those two things. Um, so it makes sense to break them up. Um, and then uh, I was like, oh, can I like eliminate some of this overlap more and I couldn't like totally get rid of the overlap necessarily but you know this is kind of nice I don't know it creates like a little swooping thing I I don't know or like maybe we break up the other word balloon um and so my king died and so my brothers died barely a year ago long I pondered my king's cryptic talk of it like that makes sense right it it's broken up it has like a rhythm to it again like we're creating this kind of like s shape that like leads us down into the panel. We still have the overlap, but like, you know, there's only so much I, I can do. There's, it's, a, it's a writer problem. Again, edit. You don't need that many words. Um, but like all of these are better than the original. Um, any of them, significant improvement. Uh, you know, we got rid of the awkward negative space. Uh, I centered the text so that there aren't rags. Uh, there's, there's still, I didn't, give a ton more room in the balloon, but like honestly, a little goes a long way with these things. Um, and I tried to break the balloons up a little bit. Um, there's only so much I can do with the balloon overlapping the character. I don't know, I did my best. Um, all right, I have like one more cautionary tale for y'all. Um, and I'm not apologizing because they know what they did. And I am gonna blame the publisher here because I believe that this is a result of a, a cash grab and likely exploitative labor. Um, but have any of you seen Twilight, the graphic novel adaptation? 
this is real. This is a real licensed published book. And again, I am not, I am not ragging on the, the artist because I'm going to go ahead and assume that we had a, a deadline that was absurd and were probably not compensated very well. I'm just going to make that assumption because there's, there's no, uh, I can't sleep at night <laughs> uh, without their if there's some other explanation for this, right? Like there's no way that this possibly could have come about in any other way. But I'm pretty sure that's just Times New Roman. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I don't know what this, these tales are. Like, I don't, I don't know what's happening here. Um, it's, it's bewildering. And, and at first I, the, like you have some balloons that are like, uh, transparent and others that aren't and at first I was like oh maybe it's just like where they had to overlap important parts of the art but then like this is overlapping her face and it's not transparent but like this is overlapping his shoulder and it is so it's like arbitrary it like this this scene is about a fight and the whole fight is obscured like, and there's plenty of space to just move this over and like not overlap your, ca it, this is, this is what, just don't do this and you'll be fine, basically. <laughs> don't do this and you'll be fine. Put your text in the right place. Uh, that is, that is the conclusion to my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we have time for questions. Do we have time for questions, Ben? Uh, yeah, you got about, uh, yeah, 10, 12 minutes. 10, 12 minutes. So I, I rehearsed this twice, and I went way over once. And I went under the other time, and I had absolutely no idea how this was going to go. Oh my god, I have so many questions. Um, yeah, uh, so in, in thinking about creating a nice block of text, uh, do you ever find yourself rewriting dialogue or whatever might go into a, a balloon uh, in order to better shape that sense of text? And at what point does that potentially come to odds with crafting the best language? Um, okay, so the question was uh, when I'm reshaping text, do I ever rewrite stuff? Uh, so that it fits better, and at, at what point does that like become an, an issue with making the the words the best that they are, basically? Yeah. Um, uh, the answer is yes. I I write my own work, so I have the freedom to do this. Um, and you know, if you're working with a writer, it can be more complicated. But absolutely, all the time, like I assume that there is going to be edits to the text in the like script and between the like script and thumbnails stage and the penciling stage, because in the penciling stage, that's when I put my text in um, and I make sure that it fits and I figure out what my balloon shape is. And I routinely will just like bust out the source.com and try to find like, what is a different way that I can phrase this so that this word is shorter or longer even to fill space. Um, and it can't like there, there are like creative, issues there of like, oh, I really like this phrase. Um, and, and that's why I figure that out in the pencil stage, because if I really like a phrase and it needs to stay that way, then like that means the art needs to change. And maybe that panel needs to be like slightly wider or maybe like the tree needs to like come down or whatever. Um, and like that's why you want to figure out this stuff as early on in the process as possible so that everything's really squishy and you can move things around and shuffle them. Um, but I also know that not everyone has that luxury. Like I get to do that because I write my own work and I have an editor that like trusts me uh, to, to make those calls. And it's, I, I haven't come across uh, an issue yet where I've had a, a, a very frustrating thing where it's like, no, the text has to be this way and it has to make your page look bad. But like, I'm, I'm sure that it will happen. <laughs> All right, and I, you had a question as well.
So do you have like a general guideline for how many words there should be per page? Uh, as few as humanly possible. Uh, the question was, do I have guidelines for how many words should be in the panel? And like, I really do mean it as few as humanly possible. You really don't need that much text. You really don't. Um, the text, the I and like, people are going to disagree with me on this, and that's fine. I'm fine with that. But I feel that in comics, the images should be doing the heavy lifting. Um, and you know, maybe you make a different kind of comics. Uh, and and that's that's fine too, uh, but you know you you want to make sure that you're eliminating all redundancies, right? I always read over my text uh, when I'm editing, and I'm like, could I draw this? Could this be in the drawing? Could this be indicated visually somewhere? Um, it, that's like one of the ways that I reduce text. Another thing that I will do is I will write my storytelling goals at the top of my script. Like, what am I really trying to communicate to the audience? Maybe I have like, depending on the length of the story, like, you know, one to three storytelling goals. And then I, I will read every line of text. And if it does not directly speak to one of those storytelling goals, I will cross it out, no matter how much I like that line, because it doesn't need to be there because it's not achieving my goal. And then I look at all of the lines that I still have. And I ask myself, are any of these lines redundant? Am I repeating myself? because I don't need to do that. Um, and that, that can be really hard. Um, and I'm not really sure what to tell you in terms of like a ratio on the page, because I think it really, it depends on like your art style and the page design, but like less is more. <laughs> yeah. uh, I hope this question doesn't uh, create another redundancy <laughs> <laughs> or make you repeat yourself too much. But uh, do you have like any advice for people doing journal comics in terms of transposing like, I don't know, like what may have actually started as journal entries into effective storytelling or imagery or like, you know, because you can, you can go in like a couple of different avenues and expressing yourself. Do you have any like kind of general rules of thumb as to so the question uh, was, I was told to repeat all the questions in case that wasn't apparent to everyone. Um, <laughs> the, the question was, uh, do I have advice for someone who is making comics that it sounds like are being adapted from journal entries? Maybe like they're starting out as, as text and then you're creating comics like based on something that maybe is like mostly text. Is that accurate? Yeah, well, that, I guess that's, yeah, like fair because like, People who, who kind of think like writers might have it, like you know, a towards comics, but struggle. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think a lot of people probably start a lot of different type of work, whether it's journal comics or you know maybe you start a comic and like your instinct is more to like you write a short story and then we're going to turn it into a comic or maybe you're making like an adaptation of something and like. I, I think that I would use a similar process of figuring out, identifying the things that you can express visually and trying to express as much of it visually as possible. Um, and also like making the decision of like, is a comic like what you're really making? Cause like maybe you're making illustrated prose and that's also a totally valid art form, you know? Um, it's, it's a, a little different than comics and your goals might be different uh, and that's fine. Uh, but if you're making comics, then like really trying to make sure that uh, your image and your text are interdependent, because that I think is like what really truly makes a comic is when you can't understand uh, what's going on without both the text and the image if the text is there. The text should add something to the image and the image should add information to the text and they should work interdependently. Um, and like that's the that's like the sweet spot of comics. I don't know if that answered your question. I raised my hand very nebulous idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I gave you a nebulous answer. That was good. And have you touched on um, building compositions with your lettering? Because I've heard other people suggest that it's a good way to figure out things so you're not just plopping things on top of each other. So um, one of the things that I've sort of struggled with here and there representation is how to best approach a, 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 a balloon for s someone either off panel or inner monologues, especially when there's more than one person in the same panel. 
Ooh, okay, so I'm being asked about how to visually express balloons for someone off panel or for an inner monologue. Essentially, like, balloons that don't have a tail that, like, points to someone's mouth, essentially. Um, and uh, for, I'm a, I'm a fan of, like, the off panel, like, tail goes off panel. You know, I'm I'm a fan of that. I'm also a fan of like tail goes off panel and like becomes part of the panel. Like it's the tail's like open. I'm a big fan of that. Um, but that's just like a stylistic thing. Um, that that's pretty. Like if someone's speaking from off panel, the tail points off panel. Um, for inner monologue, you know, there's always like thought balloon stuff. Um, or you know, you could stylize. You might stylize caption boxes. Uh, for, and you're talking about if you have like multiple characters that have inner monologues, like you might have like a different stylized shape that is specific to each character. I wouldn't go like totally nuts, uh, you know, like you don't, like there's a thing in design where you don't want to use too many fonts and I would say the same thing, like don't go all and like, and I'm so sorry, people are going to come after me for this, like don't go all Sandman on us. Like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, but you know, if, if one character has like a more rounded shape and one character has like a slightly more angular shape, or maybe if you're working in color, they have slightly different colors or something like that, that could be like a visual cue to the reader of like who the speaker is. Okay, I think I was I was given a, a three, which I mean, it's like, okay, uh, I'm it's in the back, <laughs> yeah. So, fine? so the the question is, uh, is it okay to not make a new font for every comic? Yes, very like no. You we're we're not all font designers. If you have a font that you think, as long as the the font you're using complements the style of your artwork, like use that font by all means. You know, like that's if it feels cohesive with the rest of the art, like that's great. And if you find a font that works for you, absolutely keep using it. Why not? Uh, I, I'm gonna take one more and then I'm gonna call it because Ben has already like given me an indication. Because you keep raising your hand, so I'm I'm gonna call on you. <laughs> uh, as someone who does a lot of their lettering digitally, um, what 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 resource would you recommend for someone uh, trying to start with lettering or other like like digital lettering uh, resources? Um, so the question uh, was so someone who letters digitally. What resources would I point you towards for hand lettering or other digital lettering resources? I would like to point out that all of the stuff that I talked about is not hand lettering specific. You may have noticed that. Um, <laughs> this has nothing to do with whether you're doing this by hand or doing this digitally. Um, and like, if you, I, I would, as someone who loves hand lettering, I would ask, why do you want a hand letter? Do you need to? It's onerous and unnecessary. <laughs> um, like, it, there's no reason to hand letter, honestly, um, unless you really, really love the way that it, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know why you'd want to do that to yourself, but if you did, uh, <laughs> um, is there a good resource for hand lettering? Uh, I mean, there's, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of, like, lettering, uh, guidebooks like in general uh i would say what's the what's the one that just came out Could someone no i'm thinking of the other one the nate picos one yeah that 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 there there's one that nate picos did that just came out todd klein has one um there there are several uh books that will give like lettering advice that i think is very applicable both digital and by hand um and it we'll go over like several of the tools including hand tools like the aims lettering guide and like you know making balloons in illustrator things like that but really like hand lettering because when you when you want to like get good at hand lettering then you start going into like the craftsmanship part and like that 
that's just practice. Like making letters that look pretty is like 10% skill and 90% patience. It's just like do it all the time, do it slow, uh, and really learn to do that hard part of like learning to think about the text with the drawing part of your brain, because otherwise you will accidentally start writing and you can tell. Uh, I'm sorry if that didn't fully answer your question. I am going to have Ben come up here to give uh, an announcement. Thank you.